Thank you. I want to walk through um, process, uh, what we talked about a little bit before, trying to just be able to get a handle on it because the complexities are definitely there. And what we've tried to pursue is how are the decisions made and what are the documents that DHS has provided to each entity on what the criteria is to be able to make a decision on this. So I'm just going to kind of run through this briefly here. So they CBP1 app, they say they fill out the app there, they enter the port, uh, they're screened for parole or an asylum claim, and we're trying to figure out some of that process uh, on the screening for parole and the asylum claim. Then they find out they're screened for parole, they're vetting, they get an appointment, uh, they could be turned around, they could be put, uh, paroled into the United States, then eligible for work authorization. We understand that if they are come through the CBP1 app, they get parole, they could get the work authorization within one month. Let me start there on the initial one. Somebody that came in through the, uh, through the port of entry, filled out the CBP-1 app, is it most common for that individual to get parole at that point? So just, just to clarify, uh, approximately 90% of the individuals who show up with a CBP-1 appointment are given a case processing disposition of NTA. They are served a notice to appear before an immigration judge, but ultimately as a, as a custody disposition, they are paroled out of custody. Okay. So yes. So they're paroled out of custody by 90%, you're saying on that. Best we can tell are those individuals also seeking an asylum claim, because my understanding is they've got a one-year time period to also seek an asylum claim, or are they just in parole? So they're, they're, uh, if they applied with CBP-1, they're generally given a two-year parole at the port of entry as, as a custody determination while they're in removal proceedings. And you're correct, they do have the ability to pursue asylum uh, while they're in the pendency of those removal proceedings, but they're, we're not accepting their claim per se at the port of entry as part so of the So where would they make that asylum claim? Because the clock is ticking for them to be able to make the asylum claim. How would they do that? So I, I would defer to my colleague from USCIS, but they, there is an ability for them to make that claim eventually in front of the immigration judge if they don't do uh, anything with USCIS. Davis. If they're in defense of asylum proceedings under Section 240, they would make their claim with the immigration judge. If they were in the affirmative asylum process with the USCIS, then they would make that claim with the USCIS. Depends on the pathway. But if they're under immigration proceedings, they would certainly make it with the courts. So they've got a two-year parole that they're given. 90% of the folks that fill out the CBP-1 app at that point get a two-year parole. Uh, at what point are they having a decision made on their parole and what happens next? Or are they transitioning to other visas? Are they transitioning to other status? What's happening next? We've had this process in place for about four months now. We're just trying to be able to figure out how it's operating. I can state if they were in parole status, that they were paroled in but not in immigration proceedings, then they would have the ability to file for asylum with the USCIS. What happens to them? They're in parole they've been given documentation at the border that they're in a per parole proceeding. What, what's happening? So, so again, just to clarify, the, the parole document at that point is to document the, the custody determination that they, they, they've been released. Their, their actual status is that they're in removal proceedings. So until there's an outcome with respect to the removal proceedings before EOIR, they're, they're, the fact that their parole has run out, um, at least from an OFO perspective, is, is largely irrelevant because their status in the United States is still that uh, they're pending removal proceedings. But those removal proceeding hearing would be when? They could be several years down the road. It's determined by the courts. EOIR sets the calendar for the removal, for, for the removal hearing. So we have an individual that has a two-year parole but it could be six years before they actually get a hearing. Those last four years, what's their status, other than they're in removal? Does anybody know? I don't say so th th this is helpful for us because we're asking the same questions, just trying to be able to figure out what the status is for this individual. It's our understanding as well that if they do the CBP-1 app, regardless of where they're from, anywhere in the world, about 90% are actually being paroled. Our understanding is within a month that they're getting a work authorization. Is that correct or not correct? They're eligible for work authorization immediately after they're paroled into the United States. So it wouldn't necessarily take a month at that point, it could be days. I mean, we aspire to have them complete certainly in 30 days. And so we're working you know, steadfast to make sure that happens. It would, it would just require us to be able to analyze that application that's been filed and issue them the, the employment authorization document. 
Okay, so let me, let me ask this question as well. So if, if they come to the port without going through the app, they just arrive at the port and say, hey, didn't understand the language, or I just got in line, or I didn't know, but they're at the port, they didn't do the app at all. What's different about their process? So largely the process is, is very similar. They're, they have to wait until there's capacity, right? We don't turn- Right, it may people, be a couple of days, right? right? So once they come in, the, the, the numbers for us look um, a, a bit different too, and that only roughly about half of the people who come in without an appointment are actually given an NTA and paroled as a result. So what's the difference there? Why? Uh, well, we, we didn't have their information, and, and sometimes it's about the, the, the individual circumstances that they have. Uh, presenting, there may be a reason why they didn't want to submit the CBP-1 app, but as a result of the the case-by-case -case determination, the officers have determined that, that they may be still put in removal proceedings, but they may be referred for detention. How many of those are actually turned around and told, hey, go fill out the app and come back another day? Is that happening? Uh, I, I don't think that that's a significant portion of the individuals that we're processing without appointments, no. Okay, so of the half that are turned around, they're turned around and said, hey, you're, you're not eligible to be able to come through at all, and they're literally turned around, head back to Mexico, correct? That could be a, a, a subpopulation, yes. Okay, and then the other half that are accepted through, they would go through the same process. They'd get a work authorization immediately within 30 days or less. They would be set up for parole for two years, though it could be years before they get their actual hearing, correct? So if, but our, our policy states that if someone uh, without a CBP-1 appointment is processed for removal proceedings rather than uh, having a two-year parole issued, their parole is issued for a period of only one year. Right, but they're still awaiting, they're still gonna have a gap because even the person who's given two years may have several years of gap between when their parole expires and when their actual hearing occurs. There's just a bigger gap. Is there a consequence? Is ICE pursuing any of these individuals that their parole has expired, for instance? Once the individual um, shows up at an immigration office, they should have um, reporting requirements. So they could be placed on alternative detention or just monitored on the non-detained docket at that point on an order of recognizance. But that would be starting in the first, first days that they're there. That wouldn't be something later, a year down the road, to go pursue those individuals and then put them on alternative detention. It, the, the, change in, the change in their, their position could be at any point when they're checking into our offices. Okay. Where does the rebuttable presumption kick in on this? If they have not filled out the CBP-1 app, they arrive at a port of entry, is there a rebuttable presumption? Where is that apply or is that applied? It applies during the asylum interview itself, the credible fear interview. Okay, but that would only be if they actually request asylum at that point for 50%. They're getting parole, they're not necessarily requesting asylum or they could request it later at their hearing. The rebuttal presumption would um, affect those who will um, file for or make a credible fear claim, correct? Yes, sir. So, but that would be possible, I'm just gonna say three years from now when they actually have their hearing, let's say, the rebuttable presumption would apply then. No, no, Senator, the rebuttal presumption is, is analyzed during the credible fear process itself. Um, once CBP arrives, refers the case for the, for the credible fear screening along with analyzing the exceptions to the... To the to but I'm, I'm taking this case, they arrive at a port of entry, they did not fill out the CBB-1 app, they're in that 50% that was given parole, they didn't ask for asylum at that point, they're released in the country, there is no, they're just awaiting their hearing at that point, there is no challenge. They may challenge for asylum at their hearing then, and they're gonna bring it up then, would a rebuttable presumption then apply at that point? That's, that's correct. I mean, the, the rebuttal presumption would not apply before the immigration court. The immigration judges would, would be analyzing their asylum claim um, and then withholding it of a removal and then cap during that claim. Okay, let me, let me keep going on this because I don't want to run us out of time. They're coming between the ports of entry. They, they're out in the open desert area. They actually enter at that point. Border Patrol is able to encounter them, take them to one of the stations, begin the processing. They process and then do the fingerprint, do the every, medical checks, everything else that they've got to be able to do. What happens at that individual then at that point? So very similar. Again, they'd be referred to uh, USCIS once, once processed. And um, if uh, space is available, they might be turned over to uh, ERO. Okay. That is if they request asylum, they would, USCIS would, would engage? 
Is that correct? Or are they basically all of them requesting asylum? USCIS would engage on every case of a, an asylum claim. Okay, but are all of them requesting asylum that you're encountering between the ports of entry? No. Okay, of those that are not requesting asylum, what's their disposition? Uh, they're either withdrawn or um, uh, they're either withdrawn or provided. Some of them are prosecuted. Just just depends on um, the circumstances. When you say withdrawn, help me understand what that means. Uh, so they would uh, uh, actually uh, be processed to return back to Mexico. Uh, from the country that they came, so voluntary departure. So voluntary departure at that point. Our understanding is, and this is something Senator Sinema and I have tried to track for a while, and it's expedited removal. Expedited removal sounds like you're actually moved quick, removed quickly. Our understanding is expedited removal doesn't actually mean you're removed quickly. What's the current expedited removal percentage of people that are actually removed from the country? Does anyone know? I understand it's a pretty small number, actually, of those that are declared expedited removal that are actually removed from the country. We've been trying to get that data, and every number that we've had has been a pretty low percentage. The vast majority of people under expedited removal are actually still currently in the country, and have some have been for years uh, still in the country under quote-unquote expedited removal, uh, but they're not actually removed. Uh, so. If, if that person requests asylum between ports of entry, they've been processed in the Border Patrol station, soft-sided, hard-sided facility, or whatever it may be, they requested asylum, USCIS then does the interview at that point, is that correct? And you're doing that in the stations now? We do those interviews virtually, Senator, okay. um, with the assistance of our colleagues at CBP. Um, but you're correct, it would be done in those five locations. If those individuals are deemed to have credible fear at that point, then what happens to them? If they're deemed to have credible fear, then they are issued a notice to appear and put under Section 240 um, full removal proceedings. Okay. So they appear before the Immigration Court. And they would, the, that's the notice to appear, uh, then they're released in the country, they've got a notice to appear, uh, that's with ICE, right, at some location, and then a setting, then a date is then set after that for a court hearing. Right or not right on that? Um, ICE, ICE would assess, you know, the releasability of that information, but that's correct, Senator. Then they would have a date set by the courts for them to appear before their hearing. After, after they've gotten the, the check-in with ICE at that point for the notice to appear. Is that correct or not correct? I'm trying to be able to track just dates and what happens here. That I defer to the device on. Yeah, um, typically, when a notice of uh, our notice to appear is issued, it's um, we go into ECAS and get a court date and a, and a time for those individuals if they're leaving custody. So, how long is that typically before they would get that hearing? Current, currently, where are we on a notice to appear? I'm not sure. The hearings could take years, sir, okay. with the OIR. So, uh, question on that, w when do they get a work authorization? They've been, they've requested an asylum request. They came between ports of entry, requested asylum, been given a notice to appear, released into the country. When can they get a work authorization? I mean, they're, they're eligible for a work authorization um, under, if they file the defense of asylum claim and they're before the courts, then they're eligible for a work authorization. How quickly? So um, as quickly as they file the application, we can process it. So um, certainly we're averaging around less than 60 days for defense of asylum employment authorization documents. Okay. So, so what I'm trying to figure out is if somebody fills out the CBP-1 app, goes through that process, comes to the port of entry, they're processed through into the country, and within 30 days they're going to have a work authorization, or they can come between ports of entry request asylum, and within 60 days, they'll have a work authorization, and either one of them, it'll be years before they actually have a hearing. A correct or not correct on that? In the, in the non-detained setting? The, yes, that's sir. correct. Yes, sir. Your non-detainment docket at this point, if I'm remembering correctly, USCIS has about a 40,000 person backlog in just the interview process for the non-detained docket. Is that correct? That's correct, Senator. My understanding is as well, there's another group of folks in the non-detained docket that are not in that 40,000 number that is an unknown number because their paperwork hasn't been processed yet to be able to get into that backlog of 40,000. 
I think at this point we're re relatively caught up in terms of processing, you know, cases into the system, and so I think those numbers are pretty static. The forty thousand. So the forty thousand is the number at this yeah. point. How long will it take to be able to do the interviews? Because those are individuals that typically I would assume came between ports of injury at some point. It was as Mr. Miller talked about before, at least times when there's a you know five hundred people came at once. There's not space to be able to actually hold these folks. They were released out. There wasn't an opportunity to be able to do the interviews at that point. So we've got 40,000-ish people in that group. How long will it take to be able to identify, find them, and be able to do those interviews? Well, we know where they're at because we coordinate that with our colleagues at ICE. And so and we coordinate the interviews with our colleagues at ICE, too, and the not for the non-detained docket. That's a matter of resources, of us being able to divert resources that are also interviewing credible fear claims on the border to be able to address the non-detained workload along with our affirmative asylum work. So we prioritize that work along with our credible fear work, which has certainly increased. So it's a matter of prioritization when we get to those cases. So give me a guess, how long will that take? I can't give you a, uh, an answer on that, Senator. I would have to get back to you on an average um, time to process their non-detained docket. Okay, great. I, I would make a request just from our committee as well that any guidance documents that you've received on how to make decisions on who to parole, what that decision is for these 90 percent of folks at some point that are paroled in, the 10 percent that are not paroled, there has to be some document that's a guidance to be able to make that decision and to be able to know we've asked for those documents over and over again. How are those decisions made? And most often we get an answer back from DHS that says, you know, the officer on the field will make the decision. I would say I know our structure in the federal government enough. There is some guidance there. It's not just what did the officer have for breakfast that morning and are they feeling it today? There is some guidance, but we've received nothing as far as guidance and information on how decisions are made. So that'd be really helpful to us to be able to see that process. The same thing for USCIS as you're going through that process. It'd be helpful for us to be able to see how those decisions are actually made and what the criteria is for making a decision. I really appreciate all four of you being here, the time that you put into preparing for this. We, we've had just the opportunity to be able to scratch the surface, but this is something we've asked for for a long time. Just tell us how decisions are made and what the process is, because this is a very, very new process, and we're seeing record numbers of people. The numbers dropped off dramatically right after Title 42 change, and then they accelerated again uh, to numbers, as Washington Post listed, that literally our country has never seen the numbers that were coming in for family units in August. And so we've seen the skyrocket. We're trying to understand how decisions are being made and what that looks like on the ground. So thanks again for your service and we'll follow up.